Well, last week we had the great privilege of being formally introduced to Mr. Boaz. And I told you that Boaz is the Mr. Darcy of the Old Testament, except he demonstrates neither pride or prejudice. In a word, Boaz is a man after God's own heart. He is an exemplary believer. As such, he is a person worth respecting. He is a person worth admiring. He is a person worth complimenting. He is a person worth following. As New Testament believers, it might be helpful if I said that by the grace of God, Boaz was very Christ-like. Single ladies, this is the kind of man you should be praying for. Please do not settle for a cute guy with dimples if he, if he doesn't know, love, and serve the Lord our God. For all my single friends out there, remember this. It is better to want what you don't have than to have what you don't want. So be wise. We're learning, looking over the shoulder of Boaz, and in future weeks, we'll be able to look at a wonderful Proverbs 31 woman, and that, of course, is Ruth. So ladies, we can look to the characteristics of this godly man. We can pray this for our brothers in Christ, for our spiritual fathers, for our leadership team, and for those of you who would be single, that God would allow you to wait on him for his best for you. Now, men, there is also something here, if not more for us than even for the ladies. There's something here for everybody, whether you're married or single, male or female. But as I've noted, Mr. Boaz is a man worth emulating. Again, the, the world, particularly the church, is always on the lookout for a few good men. And it seems like so many individuals that we admire at some point in their life have some sort of massive moral failing And at times we can begin to feel quite disillusioned. One of the advantages of of having heroes who are dead is that they can't mess up anything once they're in glory. So this is a guy that we should get to know. And I believe that uh, tonight we will continue to do just that. Now, if anyone out there says that it's, it's wrong for us to have heroes of the faith like John MacArthur or Johnny Erickson, Tata, I remind you of verses like Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Because some people say, well, we should only follow Jesus. So I don't have any human heroes. Well, let me remind you of what Philippians 3, 17 says. It's there in your notes. Paul says this under inspiration. There's only one perfect example. We understand this. But it, Paul says this. He points to himself and he points to others who are faithfully following the Lord. Philippians 3.17, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. We find ourselves in Ruth chapter 2. If you're not there, I'd ask that you would make your way there in your copy of God's Word. And today's message, we're going to follow Paul's advice by keeping our eyes on Mr. Boaz, who walked in a manner worthy of his calling in the Lord. Now, in this study, we have been following the tale of two widows. One is older, one is younger. One is a daughter of Abraham. The other is a Moabite convert. And by the time we reach the second act of this story, Ruth and Naomi have entered into the promised land, but they come back in many ways empty-handed. They have very little to their name when Naomi returns to the promised land and when Ruth, the daughter-in-law of Naomi, joins her on this journey back to Bethlehem. 
We're hearing stories of some people who have experienced financial loss during this current economic recession, and our hearts go out to them, or they should. We've even heard of a few people who've lost a loved one, in general, the people over the age of 65, but nonetheless, losing a grandfather or a grandmother is, is, is never easy. But I, I, I want to remind you that the two ladies that we're following on this journey have both lost their husbands. And, and Naomi has not only lost her husband, she's lost her entire family. She's lost both of her sons. And in a patriarchal culture such as this, when they return back to Bethlehem, they are in many ways completely at the Lord's mercies, which is not a bad place to be. Now, (laughs) it's a good place to be, but for any of you who have ever been anywhere remotely close to experiencing some of what these girls are going through, it's a good place to be, but it's not an easy place to be, is it? When your bank account is dry, maybe you're unemployed, you got family members who have passed away, you're not quite sure where tomorrow's meal is going to come. So here they are, walking by faith. Obviously, we've noted that Ruth is one who has stronger faith at this point in the story. She has then greater hope in God for his ability to provide, but they're not exactly sure how it's all going to happen. So let's see what happens then together. Last week I showed you that as we are introduced to now the the male leading character in this story, Boaz, uh, we've been wanting to say, well, what about Boaz is is so remarkable, so exemplary? Uh, This is a person that we would do well to acquaint ourselves with. Uh, that we might try to live as he lived, walk as he walked. And I noted last week that a man after God's own heart is, number one, he is godly. It may be very, very uh, straightforward for somebody to make that point, but it's impossible for somebody to be walking closely to God and to not be walking in holiness, This was a godly man. Secondly, we noted that this man after God's own heart is generous. And what is true of Boaz, how godly was he? In part, his godliness meter is elevated in our minds, in our hearts, because of the way in which he responds to the circumstances that God brings before him, particularly when this path crosses with these two ladies. So the godlier a believer is, the more generous they are. I told you that Boaz is conservative when it comes to his morals and liberal, small case L, liberal as it relates to generosity. And sometimes people can be fiscally conservative, which is not a bad thing at all. A lot of biblical principles would advocate for such a thing, but not at the expense of being generous. How generous? Well, we'll see the the, the measure of this man of God's godliness in large part by the generosity that he displays. And we ended our service with the the perfect song. We, We sang this. Remember, the beautiful thing about looking at Boaz's generosity is that ultimately it points us to the generous God whom he knew, loved, and served. And so he's saying this, God has shown us how to give. He offered up his son so we might live. How much did God give? Jesus gave his precious blood to wash us clean and bring us back to God. (laughs) You can't have a, a greater sacrifice and a demonstration of more generosity than God sending his only begotten son to die on a cross for sinners. And then the verse repeats as this, and I hope that this was playing through your mind over and over this week. You want to honor the Lord? How do we honor the Lord? Well, this is one of the ways we honor the Lord. God loves a generous heart. A generous heart, a generous heart. God loves a generous heart. Why? 
because that's a heart like his own heart. God is generous, amen? How generous is our Christ? Well, we, we can't even wrap our minds around. We have a hard time putting words to song in order to properly express the height, depth, breadth, and length that God is willing to go in order to demonstrate his generosity and kindness towards those he purposed to save. This is a believer who has experienced God's generosity in his own life. Just like if you're a Christian, you should spend time regularly looking back on your life and saying, what are the ways recently, what are the ways in the past that God has shown his generosity towards me and then realize that God is calling us to, to walk as the Savior walk and to live like that, to be God-like as we'll see one of the passages in the New Testament declares in a moment. So what I would like you to do is is to write this down for a little bit of homework to try to just help you to connect dots so that we're not just hearing God's word and, you know, having an emotional high, but not allowing God's word to have its transforming impact on our lives. So for practical application purposes, I would encourage you to write down five ways, kids, you can do this too, five ways that you have manifested gospel generosity during this COVID-19 and subsequent economic meltdown. God loves a generous heart. A man after God's own heart is godly first. Number two, he is generous. Have we been generous this year with our time, treasure, and talents? And you have to look at it at two levels. Some of you maybe are doing a much better job as it relates to your own blood family, And you should be generous with your time, treasure, and talents to serve your family, to bless your family, but also with your brothers and sister in Christ, specifically those of you who are part of Lake Country Bible Church. So how have I demonstrated gospel generosity? I'm I'm talking to each and every one of us. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to you. How have I? Am I? Am I demonstrating it in the measure that Boaz demonstrates it here in Ruth chapter 2? So this evening, we're going to see that a man after God's own heart is not only godly and generous, but thirdly, he is strong. And fourthly, we are going to see that a man after God's own heart is kind. A man after God's own heart is not only godly and generous, he's also thirdly, in your notes, he is strong. And we're going to have to explain what we mean because strong can mean many different things. So in what ways is he strong? And fourthly, he is kind. So you're going to see godliness, generosity, strength, and kindness on display in the text of the Word of God, okay? This is why we read the Word of God and explain the Word of God to make sure that what I'm saying is actually not just my thoughts on something, but is actually God's Word to His church. So let's look at the account. I think that a lot of this is just right there on this, the surface. And since we see a lot of, of, of reaping going on here, let's get out our spiritual reaping sticks and take all the grain that we can find in this text of scripture. So here we are, we're going back to Bethlehem. In this section here in Act 2, you have the beginning of barley harvest, and then the narrator at the end of the section, which we're not going to get to tonight, will be the end of barley harvest. Remember, there was a famine, that's why they went to Moab. Now God is demonstrating his kindness here by lifting the famine, by allowing food to be plentiful again. So Naomi decides to return. Ruth decides to go with her to serve her and to care for her. So here we are, Ruth 1.22. So Naomi returned. And with her, Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab. Notice over and over again, he's going to say, he wants us to know this and to marvel over this. She's from Moab. She's a Moabitess. And that means something to you because we've talked about the history of Moab and how extraordinary it is of what God did in the life of this and what he is doing in the life of this dear lady. So here she is, Naomi and Ruth, and they came to Bethlehem. Here it is at the beginning of the barley harvest. Act 2, verse 1, chapter 2. Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband. This is a parenthesis narrator speaking here, kind of stopping the action. He's going to bring our attention to, we've been following Ruth and Naomi. Now he says, there was a certain man named Boaz. This is a very, very important figure in the purpose plan of God. So Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth. So the complete opposite of them who are poor, destitute, stark contrast. 
He was of the family of Elimelech. Very, very important. Providence is at work. Invisible hand of providence, always working the affairs of men. Whose name was Boaz. And what does the name Boaz mean? Strong man. Now we return to the action. What's going to happen to these two dear sisters who are at the Lord's mercies? Have you ever been so hungry where you didn't, literally didn't have any food in your cupboard? You didn't know what was going to happen? Probably not those of us who are under the age of 50. So here we go. Ruth the Moabitess says to Naomi, her mother-in-law, the younger to the older, please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. We're hungry. Uh, We're not going to last long. Allow me to go out and see if God might provide through the generosity of someone. Naomi doesn't say much, at least of what's recorded here. She just says, you have my permission, go, go, my daughter. Now remember, this is taking place during what period of time? R- Ruth 1.1, historical context, very important. During the time of Judges, what do we need to know about the Judges? It was dark, disturbing, distressing. I encourage you to read the book of Judges, and you'll appreciate the, light, the bright light that shines off the pages of this book, particularly chapters 2 through 4. So she's going into a, a period where, where the, the God's people were not by and large, living very godly. And I told you there are many parallels between America today and Israel then. So she departed. Well, that's what faith does. She went and she gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened. Remember, this is Hebrew humor. The Bible isn't a comedy, but there are places that are quite funny. She just so happened, as luck would have it. Of course, we said there is no such thing as luck. That's the point. She just so happened while she was out there stumbling into a field to come to the portion of the field belonging to whom? Out of all the fields that she could have meandered into, she doesn't know this Boaz fellow. Naomi apparently has lost sight of the family relationship. She runs into the field belonging to Boaz, who was the family of Elimelech. What's God up to here? Verse 4. Now behold, it just so happened that she stumbled into the field owned by this Boaz character who is related some distant relationship to Limelech, her deceased father-in-law. And he just so happened to be the big boss traveling through. And he says to the reapers, may the Lord be with you. And they said to him, may the Lord bless you. This is a godly boss. Then Boaz said to his servants, who was in charge of the reapers? Now the foreman. He looks out and he says, I haven't seen her before, this young. Who is that? Whose young woman is this? Who's her, who's her father? Who's, who, who's her husband? Who is this? He's not upset. He's, he's curious. Verse 6, the servant in charge, the foreman of the reapers answered and said, She is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. You keep seeing the Moab, Moabite, Moab. This is all all very intentional. The word of God is unlike any book, unlike any book ever written. It is so obviously written and authored ultimately by God. Verse 7, and she said, so he's saying, this is what she said to me. Please let me glean and gather. Glean and gather. Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheep. So the reapers are the workers. She's the poor and destitute. The Old Testament law said that there's a process. We'll get into it a little bit more in future messages. But there's a process by which the poor could go out after the workers of this man's field and they could try to gather so that they could live another day. I've been told that starvation is one of the more painful and difficult ways to die. So God had instituted in his law a provision. So she asked for permission to do this. She came and has remained from the morning until now. She has been sitting in the house for a little while. It's it's unclear here. If you look at verse 3, it says that she went and did that. Was that a summary statement of what happened? And had she even done anything at this point in the story? I didn't really bring this out last week. Uh, It's possible that that's sort of a summary of what's about to happen, that this is actually telling us, in the real life, what was going on. In other words, that she's waiting for permission 
before she goes. She asks Naomi for permission. Now she's asking Boaz for permission. Or she's asking Boaz's foreman whether she could do it. So either way, look at verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, how's he going to respond? This, this, this Moabitess who came with Naomi wants to, to glean, to kind of come behind the workers and pick up the scraps. Boaz said to Ruth, he is godly, he is generous, he is strong, he is kind. Don't take my word for it. Look at his words. From out of the heart, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth what? Speaks. Speech tells us a lot about who somebody is. Then Boaz said to Ruth, listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my mates. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. Oh, and when you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. This, this is remarkable. I mean, this is this over-the-top generosity. Has, has anyone ever blessed you in such a way where you, you were embarrassed? You blushed? It's just like, no. It's, verse 10. She fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. And how you willingly left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. And most importantly, verse 12, may the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. <laughs> what a statement. I mean, these are two, I mean, they're perfect for each other. You know, have you ever, like, there's two single people, like, wouldn't it be great? Could you imagine if they had kids? <laughs> Those two raised a seed. I mean, this extraordinary, I mean, the only thing that really sets them apart is one's a little bit older than the other. And we'll get to that as well. Well, anyways, how does she respond to this? Over the top generosity, godliness, strength and kindness. She said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord. Here it is now. For you have comforted me and indeed have what? Have what? You have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. I'm not Jewish. I'm not a reaper. I'm one of those poor gleaners, and I'm not even a poor Jewish gleaner. I'm a Moabitess. I can't, I can't believe you're being so kind to me. Boaz isn't done. Boaz isn't done. This is, this is just like the heart of God. This is just like the heart of God. It's like we sing blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Grace upon grace, grace upon grace. The longer you live, the more grace you receive. And if you die young, you lose nothing because then you have eternal grace, eternal kindness. Mealtime comes, Boaz says to her, come here that you may eat of the bread. And He's just... Come to my table. Work with my girls. Come to my table. It just, he's just upping it, upping it, upping it. Come here that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers. And he served her roasted grain and she ate and was satisfied. Very important word. Famine chapter one, satisfied chapter two. Boy, God is at work behind the scenes. Even in the darkest of nights. When she rose to glean, Boaz commanded the servants, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not insult her. No jokes, no insults at her expense. Verse 16, And also you shall purposefully pull out for her some grain. They don't do that. That's not what reapers do. 
that's not what he had to do. The law, didn't, the law of God did not stipulate any of this besides just to leave the margins for the marginalized. He's not, doing, he's not just giving a tithe, we might say. How much do I have to give? 10%? Ah. Oh. He's like, I'm going to give as much as I possibly can. That's generosity that's just bubbling over. This is a godly man, isn't he? This is a man after God's own heart. Have him take it from the bundles, leave it for her that she may glean. And again, don't rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. May God add his blessings on the reading of his word. So here, let's think a little bit about this Boaz guy. Again, his name means strength or he is my strength. Yahweh is my strength. And unlike Elimelech, whose name, whose name means my Lord is king, he didn't really live as a man under the lordship of God as faithfully as he ought to have as a likely Jewish believer. Boaz, on the other hand, this man after God's own heart, lives up to his name. So we have to think about what the Bible has to say about manhood and how Boaz demonstrates God's high calling for men. True men of God are tough. They are spiritual iron men. They, they may or may not be mighty in the eyes of the world, but they are certainly mighty in the eyes of the Lord. And friend, I probably don't need to convince you, but let me at least say this, that this message tonight is needed now more than ever before. A man after God's own heart is strong. Why is this needed more than ever before? Because of the worldly world and the compromised church that continues to promote feministic ideologies. Feminism is just the air that we breathe, and it has seeped into the church. Many believe the lie, many believe the lie, even in the church, that biblical manhood and womanhood is inherently sexist. So to be man as God wants you to be, for some, is to be sexist. Because man has placed his own notions and ideas above that of God's. Ladies no longer want gentlemen. Have you seen the trend in the movies? Don't open the door for me, you pig. That's different than when I was a young boy growing up. Where'd that come from? I don't need you. Princesses no longer need knights in shining armor. They're Mulan. They're the heroines. Get behind me, baby. Postmodernists claim that gender is nothing more than a social construct. There's really no such thing as manhood and womanhood, male and female. This is the world we're living in, and it's not going away. They say gender is fluid. It's not fixed, so you can kind of be part man, part not, kind of amorphous. It's, and this is what all the smart people say, and if you don't say it, you get told that you're committing hate speech. But we need men like Boaz as examples to remind us what a man after God's own heart actually is. Evangelical feminism has been brought into the church by the likes of Beth Moore, uber popular, millions of followers, and recently in the Presbyterian church by Amy Bird. Suffice it to say, role and gender confusion abounds. So we need a word from the Lord. And certainly, Ruth chapter 2 speaks to the issues of today. Do you believe that a man after God's own heart is godly, generous, and thirdly, that he is strong? So how does a man use his strength, his spiritual strength, in a way that blesses those around him and glorifies the one who made him? God, God chooses our gender. You realize that, right? He made them male and female, right? That's the infinite wisdom of God. And neither sex is superior to the other. We have different roles, but we are equal in dignity, value, personhood, and worth. I spent seven months talking about all these things because I realized that Elmbrook and other churches were compromising and that a lot of lesser, smaller churches were just going the way of the world. So one of the ways that God, one of the ways that godly men honor God 
I think we see here illustrated in the life of of Boaz in Ruth chapter 2 and following is that godly men protect their sisters in Christ. I don't know if you, you, you picked it up because I was commenting too often, too, too much in the reading of the passages, but on no less than four occasions, Boaz uses his strength and his position to protect Ruth. He's very protective. This is a Moabitess in, in, in Jewish land, and she is a young widow. So you can imagine a young girl in a dark period. She's vulnerable. Again, this isn't me just bringing something into the text. It's right there in the text. Look at verse 8. He's protective, and he's using his strength to protect her. He says to her, listen carefully, my, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Stay here. You don't need to go anywhere else. I don't want you to go anywhere else. Stay here. Why? Stay here with my maids. She's going she's gonna to find out why. He doesn't have ulterior motives, as some men do. S- sensual motives here. This is... His generosity, his kindness that's going to be displayed. Uh, Look with me uh, at verse 15 and 16. He knows she's hungry, that they're starving. He wants her to remain at his property because he has plenty of food and he's willing to share it. He's willing to share it in abundance. He's going to go beyond what the law of God would even demand. Verse 15, same thing. When she rose to glean, Boaz commanded his servant saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and don't insult her. I'm, I'm telling you, the bo- you'll be fired tomorrow if I find out. The Bible doesn't have a stuttering problem, so when something is repeated, it's generally meant for emphasis. Verse 16, he says again, also, you shall purposefully pull out for her some grain from the bundles. They're like, he, he knew what they would be thinking. Like, you don't, why so much? You're just heaping on generosity. I mean, it's, <laughs> leave it that she may glean. And what does he say again? Verse 16. Do not rebuke her. Don't insult her. Don't rebuke her. Don't touch her. Verse 21. He wants to protect her. The safest place to be. Stay close to the other servants. Don't wander off. Bad things can happen when girls wander off with men who are wicked. Verse 22. Naomi said, It's good, my daughter, that you go out with his maids. Again, the possibility of sexual assault is not something that I'm reading into the text because that's such a big problem in America today. That's exactly what Naomi says. That was really kind of him and his very wise counsel. End of verse 22. Lest others fall upon you in the field. Beat you down, rob you, rape you, etc. Think about it for a moment. Boaz used his position and influence as a man to protect this godly and vulnerable woman from verbal, physical, and sexual abuse. Now, I hope and pray that our youth and college and career are listening to these sermons. If they're not, it would be a crying shame. But I want those of you young men who are here today under the age of 30 to look up at me for a moment. Um, God, man after God's own heart is strong. He uses his strength not to dominate, but to protect. So if some playboy tries to hit on one of your sisters, there's a lot of scumbags out there. A spiritual strong man will lovingly yet firmly try and redirect the lust. Don't leave her to fend for herself. You tell that guy, stay away from Ruth. Go find yourself a Jezebel if your heart is set on sinning. Hit the road, Jack. Don't come back. Some time ago, this isn't theory, this is life, beloved. Some time ago, one of our young ladies was being treated improperly in this church by an unbelieving married man. This was happening at her place of employment. Two young Boazes from our church heard about the situation and instinctively, instinctively, they knew that someone needed, to stick, someone needed to stick up for this sister in Christ. And because it was with another man, they said, it's got to be a man. And they didn't say, who's the man? They said, I'm probably God's man because they're godly men. So they asked leadership for counsel. Isn't that an awesome story? And no guns were drawn. No guns were even carried. 
Christian, if you know someone is experiencing genuine physical or sexual abuse, do not look the other way. Friend, brothers, men, look at me. We are our sister's keeper. Don't look for someone else to do what God would have you do. He made you man. He saved you. Now let us be godly men. Let us imitate the example of Boaz. Boaz in Ruth chapter 2 models, you can read it later, but he models 1 Timothy chapter 5 and the way he treats, he treats older ladies and the way he treats younger ladies. He models 1 Timothy 5. The true church of Christ is to be led by godly men who in partnership with local law enforcement do what they can to protect those who are most vulnerable. That's why we have Sergeant Mike at the door going through the background checks and all that stuff. Why? Because they're, they're, they're kids. We want to treat those kids like they're our own kids because in a sense they actually are because we're a family. A man after God's own heart is strong. And we're not talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger here. We're talking about something far greater than that, an inner strength that manifests itself in even more practical ways. Speaking of strength, it's fascinating to me that when the magnificent temple, did you know this? That when the temple was built for God, that one of the strong pillars had the name Boaz inscribed on it. So here's a temple, Boaz on a pillar. It's certainly a fitting picture of who this strong man after God's own heart was. First Kings 721. Let me ask you this, men. At your funeral, will our blood family be able to honestly say, this man, Scott Salick, this man, Tim Biggie, this man, Ryan Blunden, this man, fill in the blank, that this man was a strong pillar for our family? Will your church family be able to say that upon the chief cornerstone, this church was built and Brother Jones or Brother Hammer or Brother Harden, that this man was one of its strong pillars? Boaz was so legendary that a pillar with his name was inscribed on it. Here we find in the text that a man after God's own heart is godly. A man after God's own heart is generous. A man after God's own heart is strong. And finally, because some of you, we know all this mochismo, we need to be balanced where the Bible would want us to be balanced lest we get out of balance and get out of control. Boaz is also, listen to me, you ladies are going to love this. He was kind. He was kind. You see, true men of God are biblically tough, but they are also tender. I'm not talking about being effeminate. There's a big difference. One's godly, the other's not. In premarital counseling, this is some of the stuff I'm looking for. Are they godly? Are they generous? Are they strong in the right sense? And I've been thankful that these men that I've had a chance to work with, I see a tenderness. And generally when there's marriage counseling involved, one of the things that's lacking in the life of the husbands is tenderness. In other words, they are men of granite, unshakable, unmovable in their biblical convictions. We need strong men leading the church. but they are men of grace, men of grace in terms of their character. That's what was said of J.C. Ryle. He was a man of granite and yet a man of great grace. Beloved, Ruth chapter 2 verse 20 tells us that Boaz, this Boaz fellow was a kind, he was a kind and loving soul. I told you, Mr. Darcy is pretty awesome, Okay. He, he, he bails out the family. Remember when, who was it, Sister Lydia goes off and does silly things to save the family honor? Boaz is going to one-up Darcy a thousand times over. He exceeds his legal obligations, which stated that landowner, landowners need to leave the margins of their field to feed the marginalized. 
So if you're following God's law and you own property, if you owned a farm, you have an obligation to allow those who are truly destitute and poor and needy to come after your guys come, leave enough there so that they can survive. This is built into the plan of God for his people. Friends, what we see here in Ruth chapter two, like God the Father, like God the Father, Boaz is exceedingly generous and kind. When people say they don't believe in God and they don't believe in Jesus, they don't know this about God and Jesus. But he is like God in the fact that he is exceedingly generous and kind. He doesn't say, notice notice this, this is important. He doesn't say to this Moabite widow, why are you here? She shares the story with tears, all the heartbreak and loss. He doesn't say, you know, your deceased Jewish husband should have planned ahead. He should have purchased life insurance for you and his widowed mother. I'm sorry. You should have married better. Good luck and good night. No, what does he say? Look at verse eight. What does this kind hearted man do? What does he say? He says, stay here, gather food in my field. He doesn't say grab a little, but you know, it's, it's better over there. Get out of here, Moabitess. Stay. Don't go there. Stay. Fill your baskets. Look at verse nine. More than that. He says, go anywhere you want. Go anywhere you want. And, and, and work side by side with the ladies I employ. He's treating her like she's a, a Jewish employee. Look at verse 9. It goes, he goes beyond this in his kindness. He says, well, you know, you're going to get tired and sweaty working in the heat. So when you need refreshment, ask any of my Jewish servants to serve you. Friend, this is somewhat of a scandal. The Jews and some Jewish men, the lower servants, are going to be serving water to a Moabitess. This is why we need to know the history of the Moabites. Stop <laughs> you. Basically, he says, listen, you hear about a problem? Whatever I can do. This is what a kind of man is. Whatever I can do, whatever I can do to ease your burden, I want to do it. Don't you love this guy? And by the way, I don't want to make too much of Boaz that we miss God in this. Friend, this is clearly, and that's why we talked about providence even before talking about Boaz, this is clearly the hidden smile of providence deploying a man after God's own heart to provide for, encourage, and bless two godly yet very needy believers. They were at the Lord's mercy. Maybe, maybe God will somehow, some way, you know, and, and he's exceeding their wildest dreams and imagination here. This is extravagant grace, kindness, And the kindness of Boaz ultimately is intended to direct us upward to God because every good and perfect gift ultimately flows from whom? From him. And I want to remind you, friend, that it was a supremely generous benefactor, God, that created these laws to help care for the needy to begin with. We call it the law of Moses some places because it was written by man, but we also call it what? The law of God. What is it? Yes. Ultimately, the law of Moses is the law of God because it was divinely inspired. And it was God's plan because of God's heart. Leviticus chapter 19, 9 and 10. God talks about, you know, leave the margins for the marginalized. Leviticus 19, 9 and 10. Leviticus 23, 22. Deuteronomy 24, 19, 22. I think it's on the final page of your notes. The song is titled, You're a Good and Gracious King. Some people say, you know, I like the God of the New Testament. I like Jesus in the New Testament. I don't really care for that guy in the Old Testament. Law, grace. No, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And he has all of those attributes. But we miss in the Old Testament, we, we, we miss because there's so much judgment because God's people and the nations are so disobedient. We see God's wrath on display, but over and over again, we also see the kindness of God, the mercy of God, the patience of God, the love of God. In some ways, God's love and God's kindness shines brightest against a dark backdrop of the night of sin. And that's exactly what we have in the book of Ruth.
why so many people are here on a beautiful sunny night in Lake Country, Wisconsin. Because we just are enraptured with the God of the Bible. And this is better being inside with air conditioning than it would be outside in the sun. Ruth, she is deeply, she is deeply moved. She hasn't known much kindness since her, since her husband passed away. Look at verse 10. Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of little old me, especially saying that I'm a foreigner? And she says, <laughs> the, the, the kindness that you're showing, it, it, it's overwhelming. I mean, you're going beyond the pale. Naomi, eventually she goes home and says, can you imagine the joy in her heart? I, she had a lot of, she had so much grain, I don't know how she brought it back home, but she got there sweaty, her, her face, obviously, she probably went in for that, not knowing what was going to happen. Somewhat, I mean, she has hope in God, but it's difficult circumstances. God's people don't always smile, but I can guarantee you she came home smiling. Mom, you got to, oh, this happened, duh, 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 duh. How does Naomi respond to this? What does she see? Look at verse 20. Naomi is given a recap of what happened. She too sees God's kindness on display through the compassion and protection and kindness of Mr. Boaz. Verse 20, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and the dead. You say, well, God's kind. Boaz was kind. What about me? I'm not Boaz and I'm not God. Should I just let God take care of people? I mean, he, he, he doesn't lack anything. If you're a Christian, you belong to the body of Christ. It's a beautiful imagery, isn't it? It's a beautiful, beautiful metaphor. We are the body of Christ. The Bible says that we are the hands and feet of Christ. Yes, God can, God can work without us. He doesn't need us. But often through providence, he grows us in the Lord. He puts people in our he brings people across our path. So we happen to be in the right place at the right time. He blesses us in ways, some more than others. Some have more time, some have more talent, some have more treasure. Do you have a generous heart? Do you have a kind heart? Do you have a kind spirit? Are you known as a kind person? Friend, God's people are commanded to be generous givers. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18 that they are to generously support pastors and missionaries. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says that God's people are to be generous as they seek to meet the needs of their brothers and sisters in Christ. This is all throughout the New Testament. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, write it down, memorize it later. Galatians 6, 10, therefore, here's God's word to us, the church, therefore, as we have opportunity, as God gives us opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And especially, and especially to the family of faith. Behold your brothers and sisters. Look around you. We're family here. We're to love one another, care for one another. James chapter 2, verse 16. James 2, 16 says, If a fellow brother or sister in Christ has a legitimate need, and if you're able to help a person, if you're able to help them, that if you, if you have true faith, you will help them. And if you regularly don't help people who have needs with what, how, when you could help them, as God puts on your heart and gives you means to do so, the Bible says, James, you better test to see whether or not your faith is even genuine. You can read it for yourself, James chapter 2, verse 16. Man after God's own heart is strong. A man after God's own heart is kind. He is tough. He is tender. You say, well, how often do I need to manifest these virtues in the power of the Spirit? To him who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, what does the Bible say? To him it is sin. We should always do the right thing because it is always the right thing to do. And we have, the world can be so generous sometimes on believers. It can be so generous, humanitarian-minded, 
We should, we should put them to shame because they don't, know, they don't know the kind of generosity that we've experienced, do they? They haven't come close to tasting this. This is what Ephesians chapter five, verses one and two says. Ephesians five, one and two. It says, be imitators of God. I, I, at one point I was gonna say that Boaz is God-like and I'm like, it doesn't seem right. I, I probably need to say Christ-like because Christ was a man and God. But then I came across this passage and it actually says that in some ways we can, we can imitate God in the power of the spirit. So how are we to be imitators of God? We're, we're to be like God. What are you talking about? As beloved children, here it is, here it is, walk in love. Walk in love. You want an example of God's love and kindness? Look to the cross. Be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. I mean, the greatest demonstration of love and kindness is to lay down your life for another. Fred, I want to remind you of what we've been seeing in the Gospel of John. Dear friend, look to Christ. Boaz ultimately directs us up to God and his generosity. Boaz ultimately manifests Christ-likeness. So through Boaz, we see Christ. And I remind you of what 2 Corinthians 8, 9 tells us, that he who was infinitely rich, who was adored by the angels in heaven, who enjoyed perfect unbroken fellowship with the Father, he who was infinitely rich, he became poor. He became poor that through his poverty, by virtue of the incarnation and the cross, why did he come and become poor? as it were, poor, and this isn't talking about predominantly physical poverty. He emptied himself, God becoming human. Why? That we, that we might become spiritually rich. He did it for us. He did it for you. The kindness, the generosity, the love of our God and our Christ. We've learned today in the wonderful, wonderful story of Ruth, that a man after God's own heart is not only godly and generous, he's also strong and kind.